Good evening. It's time to begin our evening service. I have a few announcements that we need to make. There's an ongoing diapers and wipes basket shower for Elliot Matthew. He will be here October the 18th. Questions and answers will be next Sunday night, September 24th. Our area-wide fall gospel meeting begins tomorrow. I say next week. Starts here in just a few minutes. This week. This week. Monday. Tomorrow we will be in Mulberry. Tuesday at Rainer Road. Wednesday, Pleasant Valley. 7 o'clock Monday night and Tuesday night, 6.30. Wednesday night here at Pleasant Valley. A uh, new adult class begins October 1st. Britt Jones will be teaching that class, building a Christian home. They will be meeting in the uh, Noah's Ark room uh, next door. LTC begins Wednesday, October the 4th. There's a ladies gathering scheduled for October the 10th, Tuesday evening at 5.30 at the Cracker Barrel. The fall retreat is coming up October 20th through the 22nd. It's time to begin paying for those at nights. Uh, we have campsites 39 through 51. Um, if you're staying in the lodge, that's $15 uh, per room per night. And the council rooms are $20 uh, per night. You can get with Shannon on, on paying that. Ladies retreat is November 3rd and 4th. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. The cost is $15 per night. You're asked to uh, pay by next Sunday, October the 1st. And uh, some uh, ladies from some other congregations are going to be invited starting uh, Sunday, October the 1st. So uh, please keep that in mind. And bonfire and hot dogs at our house on November the 11th. There are several in our prayer list that uh, we need to uh, continue to re remember. Uh, Larry Prater, we mentioned this morning, uh, needs to have an aortic valve replacement. He plans to go to Houston on October 2nd for that procedure but there are some uh, complications with insurance. And so uh, pray about that particular situation that he's able to have that surgery and able to travel to Houston safely. Uh, Johnny House has a knee replacement coming up soon, October 9th. Daryl Hayes has an echocardiogram scheduled as well. And I uh, ask that you keep him in your prayers. Uh, I also got word this afternoon that Eugenia Garrison, many of you might remember, uh, was a member here for quite some time. I understand she passed away this past Friday night. And so uh, please uh, keep that family in your prayers as well. I believe that's all the announcements I have. Let's take our books and turn to number 610. Number 610. <clears throat> Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to him I sing, onward I go. Closely to him I cling, blessings still flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior, he loves me too.
608. He took my burdens all away, up to a brighter day, he gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing, in my joy bells ring, he gave me a song, a wonderful song, he gave me a song. song I now can sing praise to him my king he gave me a song a wonderful song he gave me a song to sing about he lifted me from sin and doubt oh praise his name he is my king a wonderful song Song. And some of these days in that fair land, sing with a chorus, Granny gave me a song, a wonderful song, he gave me a song to sing about, he lifted me from sin and doubt, oh praise his name, he is my King. Jack Lewis will lead us in opening prayer. Let's be standing for the prayer to make standing for the song of love. Would you bow with me? Oh Lord, you are our God. We give you praise. We give you honor. You're the God who created us, and we owe you everything. We owe you our lives our very existence. We owe you our praise, and we pray that you will accept our praise as worship to you this hour. Help us, Lord, as we worship you. Help us to glorify you in everything that we do. Listen to our songs and our prayers. And Father, please bless the speaker this hour. Help him to Remember the things he has prepared. And Father, we ask you to show mercy to all of us. Forgive us as we forgive our neighbors. Help us who are not able to be here with us this hour. Lord, you are our God. We ask that you be with our enemies. Please bless those who curse us. Help them to come to the realization that you are God. We cannot do anything on our own. We owe everything to you. Please be with our missionaries in foreign fields. We're struggling under undesirable circumstances. We ask, Father, that you bless them and help them to reach the lost. Father, there are those in within short distance of this building who do not know you. Help us to reach out to them and touch them, to teach them. For you are God. And it's in, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Turn number 604. <clears throat> you may have 
and your worldly pleasures, your silver and your gold. You may pile up all the riches that this old world can hold, but I'd rather have my Savior with him and take my stand. For I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. I want to be ready to meet him by and by. I want to be ready to meet him in the sky. Oh, I want to be more like him and do his blessed command. Oh, I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. You may talk about your riches, your diamonds and your pearls. You may gain the wealth for ages of this and all the world. But the Savior is more precious, with him I'll take my stand. For I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. I want to be ready to meet him by and by. I want to be ready to meet him in the sky. Oh, I want to be more like him and do his blessed command. For I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. There is one thing I can boast of, salvation from the fall. I'm an heir to wealth and glory, my Father owns it all. That is why I'm shouting happy and go at His command. For I want to be ready to meet Him in the glory land. I want to be ready to meet Him by and by. I want to be ready to meet Him in the sky. Oh, I want to be more like him and do his blessed command. For I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. Song of invitation tonight will be number one, five, five, 24. Number five. Good evening. Good to see all of you here this evening. Hope you had a good afternoon. Looking forward to spending some time in worship and studying the Word of God together. I want to take just a moment. I hope that uh, those of you here this morning enjoyed listening to Benny as much as I did. Um, this congregation is to be greatly commended for its commitment to mission work. I have been, I've mentioned on several occasions, I've been doing this for about 40 years, a little bit more than 40 years work with several different congregations that I've never seen a congregation where either percentage-wise or total money-wise there was as much given to mission work as there is here. Uh, I'm appreciative of our elders who are committed to mission work. I'm appreciative of our members who support that mission work because it doesn't matter how much the elders want to do mission work. If, if the members who fill the pews don't provide them with finances, nothing can be done. We are greatly blessed here with some people who are really interested in enriching the world with the gospel, and they, they live that out through their contributions, and for that, uh, the Lord is, and, and I am, and our elders are eternally grateful. It allows us, you need to remember, you know, we're living in Van Buren, Arkansas. Through that mission work that we are supporting, we can have an impact in India, and in Thailand, and in Ethiopia, and in Nicaragua, and in all these places we help support, along with all these places where in search television goes. We are having an impact on the souls of men because of our participation. Many talked this morning about the fact that we're all partners, we're all working together. I remember uh, my second pre my, both of my first two preaching jobs were next to Army bases. First one was in Enterprise, Alabama, which is next to Fort Rucker. Which were they, at that time, they trained all the Army helicopter pilots at Fort Rucker. So if you spent very much time around there, you heard a lot of helicopters. My second preaching job was in, uh, in uh, Columbus, Georgia, what used to be Fort Benning, and now changed the name to Fort Moore. Fort Benning is the largest military base in the United States, or largest infantry base in the United States. And... We used to talk a lot about the fact that they sent a lot of people there to train. It's where Officers Candidate School was. It's where they trained Rangers, people to jump out of airplanes. I never understand why people wanted to do that, but, uh, but they did. 
and they got trained to do it. So there were a lot of people in there on short-term duty who came in and out. And as a result of that, we had a lot of people at, at, attending church at Church Hill where I preached. Who would they be there for a month or two months or six months or eight months? And we always talked about the fact that because of our positioning, we could have an impact on the church throughout much of the United States. Because young men would come to, to, to Fort Benning, would stay there for a few months, would come to Torch Hill, and while they're there, they're worshiping and they're learning and they're growing, and, and as, as they grow and worship, then they go back home. And they take what they learned while they were with us back home. And so uh, you need to always keep in mind that your influence, your uh, participation in the work of the Lord is not limited to where you are. An impact can go to a lot of different places, and the fact that we uh, contribute to so many mission works means that our influence, the congregation of the Lord's church, is spread throughout the world. And we need to, we need to understand that, and you need to be. And I know we use this word the wrong way sometimes, but I'm going to use it anyway. We need to be proud of that. We need to understand the impact that we're having. Tonight is questions and answers. I've said this on several occasions. Let me set the start tonight. I do not believe if you are sincerely looking for the truth, there is any such thing as a stupid question. Now, if you're trying to trap somebody, if you're trying to make somebody look like an idiot, if you're asking a question just to cause a, a, a problem or trouble, that can be a stupid question. First uh, Timothy, Paul talked about foolish questions, and those are the kind of questions that that people were not looking for to get the truth, they were looking to get people in trouble. But if you're really sincerely trying to find the truth, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And those of us who are members of the church have, to, for, um, have been for a long time have to remember that we weren't always in the position we're in today as far as maturing and understanding and knowledge of Scripture. Forty years ago, I didn't know as much as I know now. And because somebody who's only been a member of the church for a few years and doesn't know as much as I do is not an insult to them. They haven't had the opportunity to learn and to grow and to, and, and to study and, and to learn more. And so don't look down on people because they, they ask questions and don't make fun of them because they don't know something that you think is simple, that you think you know, because for them it may not be. Question number one. Genesis 7 and verse 11. If you've got your Bible, you might want to turn now. Genesis 7 and verse 11 is in the middle of the recording of the great flood. Genesis 7 and 11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. The question is, could this fountains of the great deep mean water, lava, and molten rock, and this helped make and remake the world. That passage in verse 11 tells us you're getting water from two different sources. The windows of heaven are open. That's rain. The fountains of the great deep are open. What are the fountains of the great deep? There, are, there have been two suggestions that are made, and I'm going to give you the two suggestions, and I'm going to tell you the one I think. One of those suggestions is, you remember several years ago over in Southeast Asia where there was an earthquake in the middle of the ocean? What happened? Tsunamis. There were places that got flooded that had never seen that kind of water before because the upheaval of the, of the ocean floor caused that water to just go all over the place. And so there are some people who think when it talks about fountains of the great deep, it's talking about the floors of the ocean. Well, there were earthquakes, there was some way that God lifted those floors or changed what was there, and that's what caused a lot of that water to come out. And so, to them, that's the understanding of Fountain of the Great Deep. The second idea is, and this is the one I hold to, for some reason or another, the surface of the earth was cracked, was opened somehow. Whether it was earthquakes, whether it was God doing it specifically, whether it was something else going on, but the, the surface of the earth was cracked open. And the water and, and the fluid that's underneath the surface of the earth wasn't under the surface of the earth anymore. It was on the top of the earth. All of us are aware of and have seen and probably may have dealt with what are called underground streams. My hometown in northwest Georgia, a little community of about 1,500, 2,000 people, what city water source comes from an underground river, underground stream. 
When I was a kid, we used to travel from our house to my great grandparents' house in what's called Copper Hill, Tennessee. In order to get there, you had to go across Old Fort Mountain. And there were two different, two or three different spots on Old Fort Mountain. We would always carry, of course, we don't, nobody had the, many of you may not know what they are. When I was a kid, you had glass Coke bottles. And when you bought those, you had to keep them when you finished them because you had to take them back to the store and get money for them. You had to pay three cents for them when you got them. And when you took them back, you got three cents back. So we always had glass Coke bottles. We would take them in the car and we would stop on the side road where we saw it. There were underground streams coming out of the side of that mountain. And water would be running down the side of that mountain. It is the coldest, best tasting water I have ever put in my mouth. It was amazing when two seconds before that, it was underneath the surface. There's water, there's rivers, there's lakes, there's all kinds of things. The, the, the center of the earth, according to most scientists, it's primarily liquid. And so the fountains of the great deep very well may have reference to the fact that the surface of the earth cracked open in different places, and a lot of that fluid that's underneath there came out. And that's what caused a part of what caused the water that covered the face of the earth. You also have to consider, I believe, and I think there are a lot of people who agree with me, I believe the surface of the earth was radically changed by the flood. If you think about it, water 15 cubits above the highest mountain, 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain, Look at what happened in, in uh, Moffat a couple of years ago when it got flooded. Schools were destroyed, houses were wiped out, roads were broken, all kinds of damage was done from that little old Arkansas River flooding by 10 or 15 feet. Can you imagine? 22 feet above the highest mountain. Can you imagine how much water that is? How much damage that would have done, how it would have radically change the surface of the earth. I am convinced, and I, again, I may be dead wrong, I'm not a scientist, I am convinced, that's where the Grand Canyon came from. In fact, I'm convinced where well, a lot of the Grand Canyons came from. I think a lot of the mountains were formed by that upheaval, the surface of the earth being changed. Some scientists even believe some uh, Christian scientists even believe that before the flood, all the continents of the earth were connected. If you look at them, it looks like a puzzle. Genesis chapter 1 says the, 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 all the, 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 that all the waters were gathered together and all the dry land was gathered together. And so there's a possibility that all of the continents that we know of today were one land mass. And that the upheaval of the flood changed all that. I, I think we radically underestimate the change that happened on the surface of the earth because of the flood. We think about a flood and we think of a little flood like we deal with. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about water being 15 to 20 or 25,000 feet deep. That's a lot of damage. And to get that much water, it's got to be more than just rain. And so my understanding of that is that's where that water came from. Now that's my understanding. I don't have a dogmatic passage of scripture to go by. All it says is that the fountains of the great deep opened up. It doesn't say what they are. I think that's what they are. That's my opinion. And you're allowed to have your own opinion. And you can disagree with me as much as you want to. You have a right to be wrong just like anybody else does. Um, second question. I have heard that there is a special place in hell. I've heard this all my life. And my question has always been the same thing. Where do you get that from? Because it certainly ain't in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say anything about a special place in hell. Now, usually what people are talking about is they look at the, the, that guy so wicked, that guy so horrible, that guy so mean, that God's got to do something extra to him. So there's a special place in hell for him. The Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, it goes on to say, I never cared for the term, but could this apply to Judas, the betrayer, who Jesus said surely he would 
Uh, he who the son, betrayed the Son of Man would have been better if he had never been born. A couple of things I want to say about that. The first one is, the reason it would be better for Judas he would never been born is because he is eternally lost. He is in hell. It's a very simple statement to make. I'd be better off if I'd never been born and never existed and end up in hell. That statement doesn't necessarily mean that Judas ended up worse than the rest of them. The second thing I want to say about that is this. A lot of this is based on the fact that we as human beings categorize sin. This sin is worse than 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 this sin is worse than... And so we make the people who do this are worse than the people who do this. Now in a human perspective, that very well is true. I've oftentimes made this statement. People who abuse children don't need to be put in jail. They need to be put under the jail. Now, you may think I'm unchristian in that feeling, but that's just the way I feel. Children don't deserve that. And anybody who does that to them. And so we as humans, can't, we, we make a list of what the worst sins are. And betraying Judas, betraying Christ, which Judas did, is at the top of our list. I want to ask you a question. Which one is worse? Betraying Jesus or denying Jesus? From God's perspective, there's no difference. From the human perspective, I'm not so sure there's any difference either. The difference between Judas and Peter was not that Judas' sin was worse than Peter's. It was that Peter repented. And Judas did not. That's the difference. Doesn't have anything to do with uh, who committed the worst sin. Sin is sin is sin. And any sin, unforgiven sin, will keep you out of heaven. I don't care what it is. And God doesn't make categorizations of this worth, this sin is worse, and this sin is worse, and this sin is worse, and this sin, and this one over here is so horrible, you're going to be treated worse, and this one over here is not so horrible, so you're going to be treated... Uh, if that were the case, the best part of hell there is, I still don't want to be there. Now, let me say this. We talked about this Wednesday night. Luke 24, Jesus talked about the fact, verse 47 and 48, those who do not know their master's will and don't do it will be beaten with few stripes. Those who know their master's will and don't do it will be beaten with many stripes. And I said in that Wednesday night class, I believe that teaches that there are degrees of punishment. I may be dead wrong, but I believe that. What they are, what they mean, what different degrees of punishment are, how God does it, I have the foggiest idea. Because scripture doesn't say. But I will give you one, one hint that, that I think makes sense. If you have been sitting in church for the last 20 years and you haven't been listening to sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon, you've heard a little, you've listened to hundreds of invitation songs and you know that you need to respond to it and you don't, what do you think one of the things you're going to be doing in eternity while you're in hell? You think that might cause a little mental anguish? All I had to done was obey the gospel. I knew it. I heard it. I understand it. I believed it. I just wasn't really to step out. Or a person who went to church for 25 years was a faithful member of the church and then quit. And walked away. Turned it. How do you think he's going to feel? Judgment day comes and he's eternally lost. So part of that, uh, at least some of that degrees of punishment may very well be mental. We're not going to lose our memory when we get to eternity. We're not going to forget what we have done and how we have lived. So I'm sure that will, that will carry with us. Question number three. I once heard that Jesus lifted up his head to the heavens when he prayed. At what point did we start lowering the head and why? The fact of the matter is what that person said in that statement is true. 
but it leaves out something. Yes, Jesus lifted up his head to heaven. Jesus also kneeled. Jesus also laid flat on the ground. Jesus also lifted up his hand. Jesus also stood up. Jesus also lifted up his eyes to heaven. The posture that you take when you are praying has nothing to do with it. None whatsoever. What is important is the attitude of the heart and the content of the prayer. Whether you're standing up, whether you're sitting down, whether you're driving in a car, whether you're kneeling on your knees, whether you are flat on the ground, or whatever position you want to put yourself in, doesn't have anything to do with whether or not your prayer is right with God. What has to do with it is my attitude as I approach God and the content of the prayer that I am praying. What am I praying for? What am I talking to God about? And why am I talking to God like that? Am I looking at God like he's a, a uh, uh, lovely Santa Claus who gives me everything I want? Am I praying to God like he's he just like the rest of us? Hi, Daddy, how you doing? Or am I approaching God as my eternal Father and as the creator of the universe and as the God that we can neither fathom nor understand? And who a God who, owes, who we owe reverence and respect and honor to because he is God. That's what matters. Not what position I'm in. I remember when I was a kid, and I don't know how many of you ever saw this or know about anyone, anyway, but when I was a kid growing up, the men in the congregation always sat right on the end of the inside aisle. All the way back on both sides. Because when somebody got up to lead prayer, 90% of the men in that congregation stood up, stood out, stepped out of the aisle, and went down on one knee. If we had a person sitting in one of those chairs on the podium, whether he was a song leader or the preacher or somebody waiting on anything, when that prayer started, he got down on one knee. I don't know where that, that uh, custom came from. I don't know how it got started. I don't know who started. But it went on for probably 15 years of my life. All the men got down on usually the right knee when the prayer was on. Even the guy who was leading the prayer was down on one knee. Custom, tradition. What position you are in has nothing to do with it. Now, I remember when I was a kid, if a prayer was being offered, my mother would always look at us and say, close your eyes. And I always wondered why. Whether your eyes are open, your eyes are closed, they have nothing to do with it. I figured out why later. It was to keep you from being distracted. Because if your eyes are open and you're looking around, your, your, your mind's going to not be where it's supposed to be. So I understood where that came from. But bowing your head and closing your eyes is a custom. It's a tradition. Now that's not to say it's a bad tradition. It's just to say it's a tradition. Some traditions are good. Some traditions are bad because they deny the, the, the authority of the Word of God. Remember, Jesus told the Pharisees, why are you uh, putting your traditions above the law of God? Because you tell a person if, you're, if the money you are going to use to take care of your parents is devoted to God, then you don't have to take care of your parents. That's not what the Old Testament said. That was their tradition. And so their tradition violated the law of God. When you do that, it's wrong. When it's tradition simply because it's tradition, nothing wrong with it. As long as it doesn't get in our way of worshiping God. We... When I was a kid growing up, and for a long time, every congregation I knew of, within 100 miles of my hometown, had Bible study at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning and worship at 11. That was their traditional time. Sunday evening during the summertime was at 7.30. During the winter, it was at 6 o'clock. Wednesday night was always 7.30. 
Every congregation I knew of did it that way. Now, does that mean when I, when I was living in Montgomery, I, I was uh, talking to a man about coming to, in fact, it ended up being the place where I moved for my first preaching job. I was talking about setting up a time to come talk to them, and I said, what time do your services begin Sunday morning? He said, it's a scriptural time, 9 o'clock. And I said, no, that's not scriptural time. Scriptural time is 10 o'clock. The fact of the matter is, neither one of them is. doesn't make any difference. I had attended the congregation when I was in the Army in Western Army. The guy who taught the Wednesday night Bible class had Army duty on Wednesday night. We had midweek Bible class on Tuesday. Anything wrong with that? No. It's tradition. Some traditions are good, some traditions are bad, some traditions don't make any difference. But the, the posture that you take, and what position you place your body when you pray, is a tradition. It has nothing to do with the rightness or the wrongness or the acceptability of the prayer that you are offering. Now, if you want to bow your head and close your eyes, go right ahead. If you want to hold your hands up to heaven, go right ahead. If you want to fall flat to your face, go right ahead. I don't know very many people do that anymore. But that used to be, and, and in Scripture, that was a very popular thing. There were a lot of people who fell flat to their face. It was a sign of humility. You remember Peter in the boat when he recognized who Jesus was, the first thing he did was fell flat to his face. It just doesn't. It's not important, it doesn't matter, and most importantly, and here's something we've got to hold on to, it's not important enough to fight about. We have a tendency sometimes as members of the church to fight about the dumbest thing. You know, things that don't amount to a hill of Now, if it's, if it's, if it's commanded in Scripture, we better stand up for it. It's not commanded in Scripture, and it's not there by example or by necessary inference. And don't fight over it. I've seen congregations fight over the color of carpet, pews or chairs, new preacher, old preacher. I'm done. I only had three questions. The um, Before I close that, let me mention the next time I do this will be uh, the month of December. I'm not exactly sure what day, what Sunday in December that's going to be because I've got to figure out where the holidays are and I haven't taken time to do that yet. So uh, We'll figure that out and let you know before too long. And if you come up with any Bible questions in the meantime, write them down, uh, give them to me, record them somehow. Uh, I'll do the best that I can to answer your questions for you. I hope that you're gaining as much from this as I am. Now, I know there are some of you that think these questions that we, at, we looked at tonight are probably not that important. And for some of us, they're really not. But for some, somebody who asked that question really needed an answer. So I tried the best that I could to give them the answer. The most important question in the world and I, the most important question you will ever ask yourself is this question. Am I right with God? Because the answer to that question determines your <laughs> eternal destiny. And the only person who knows the answer to that question is you. You can fool everybody else. You can fool the elders. You can fool the preacher. You can fool your wife. You can fool your husband. You can fool your kids. You can fool your grandparents. You can fool your best friend. You can fool members of the church. But I can promise you this. You're not going to fool God. If you're not right with God, get right. If you're not a Christian, obey God. Become one. Obey the gospel before it's eternally too late. If you're a child of God, then walk away from your relationship with your father.
come back home before it's eternally too late. If you're subject to the invitation of the Lord in any way, we invite you to come while together we stand and while we stand. Taken of the supper this morning, the Lord's Supper will be served on the room on my right. Following this song, we'll be led in prayer with Brother Kate Allman. Number 524. No, that's what we just sung, wasn't it? 877, I'm sorry. 877. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, would it be wonderful there? Ended the troubles and care the little story land, would it be wonderful there? Would it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing, oh, would it be wonderful there? And talking with Christ the supernal one, would it be wonderful there? Praising, adoring the matchless eternal one, would it be wonderful there? Would it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing, oh, would it be wonderful there? The tempest will never be sweeping us. Would it be wonderful there? Sure that forever the Lord will be keeping us. Would it be wonderful there? Would it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear. Joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Oh, would it be wonderful there? Father in heaven, we come before you today recognizing you as our creator, our caregiver. We thank you for allowing us the privilege to worship without fear of persecution. And we are mindful of all those around the world, our brethren that is not able to share such a privilege, and we ask that you continue to watch over them. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our ability to come here and gather today and again we pray for all those who who do not share that and we ask that you watch over them and keep them close and if it be your will to bring them back here today we thank you especially most of all for your son an opportunity through him to live with you for all eternity in his name we pray